The Michigan State Spartans, in hiring Jonathan Smith, essentially made a statement that they are willing and able to swim in the deep end of the pool. That they crave pursuing championships at the conference and national level. And that they are willing to do whatever it takes to not just survive in the new Big Ten, but thrive in it. With this hire, and with the report surfacing that Alan Haller wanted to part ways with Mel Tucker before the beginning of the 2023 season, I think that Michigan State has a great athletic director in Alan Haller. And right now, I think that consequentially, in part because of a great athletic director, Michigan State now has a great head coach, and I think that could be underselling Jonathan Smith as a coach. He could be near elite or elite. I saw this being reported during halftime of the game when my Michigan Wolverines beat the Ohio State Buckeyes 30-24. to Michigan right now controls the Big Ten. The Big Ten runs through Ann Arbor, and Michigan for the first time from a total talent and ceiling and potential really power rankings point of view, is number one in the Big Ten. I think they have the Big Ten's best offense, the Big Ten's best defense, and their special teams unit has been improving weekly. And in half of their games, they didn't have Jim Harbaugh on the sidelines coaching. But I will tell you as a Michigan fan, if Jim Harbaugh were to leave Michigan after this season, one of the first names that I wanted to to be contacted by the university outside of Michigan's offensive coordinator, Sharon Moore, was Jonathan Smith himself. I'm happy for the Spartans, but I also feel an emotion called fear and another of excitement because Michigan State, with Jonathan Smith, can build a program that can contend for the Big Ten, that can compete with Michigan and beat them in a year-in, year-out basis, and... Not only does that bring, I think terror is an exaggeration at this point. I need to see how Smith does in year one, year two, and if he can even get this program off the ground, which I think he can. But there's also excitement, because if he can do that, then the Big Ten will have multiple programs competing for the top. And as much as I love the game to be the best rivalry in sports, which it is, the best rivalry in the Big Ten, which it is and will always be. And as much as I like it when Ohio State and Michigan are the two best Big Ten programs, and I think that will be the case for the most part in the new Big Ten, it's fun to see other teams compete. Teams that come out of nowhere, and maybe they have a fluke Cinderella story or they build something consistent. Michigan State is looking for consistency, and Jonathan Smith built Oregon State from the ground up, and I think he can do the same at East Lansing because Michigan State's not known for having a ton of talent. But then, ask yourself, does East Lansing or Corvallis, Oregon have more talent? And I think you realize that if Jonathan Smith did as much as he did with the Beavers, with the talent that he had, Imagine what he could do with a better recruiting base, a better brand, more support from the athletic department and donors. Just imagine, picture in your mind what he could do. Before we resume this video, please hit the like button. Please subscribe to the channel. Click that big red subscribe button if you think that this was the best hire that Michigan State could have made, realistically. I know that a lot of people wanted Urban Meyer That was something that was really never going to happen in hindsight. And even when there were rumors surfacing that Urban Meyer was meeting with Michigan State, my approach was, we'll wait and see. I totally believed that he could have taken that job or the Texas A&M job when it opened up. But I don't know if Urban Meyer is interested in coaching. I know for sure, though, that Jonathan Smith is younger. I know that Jonathan Smith knows more about the current state of the game than Urban Meyer does. Meyer's been away since 2018, 2019. And believe it or not, the sport has changed a ton since then. Name, image, and likeness. The transfer portal. That stuff ties into players, young men, kids, 
whatever you call the college football players, not wanting, in some cases, to put up with more traditional coaches. It's just a reality. And that's not a good thing, nor is it a bad thing. It just is what it is. I'm in favor of name, image, and likeness and players being compensated. But it does present some new negatives. It also presents, obviously, some positives. You get to see great men be paid for something that they like to do and get compensated rightfully so for their name, image, and likeness. And Smith, I don't know if Oregon State's delved into NIL that much, but I know that they've used the transfer portal. They've had players exit through the transfer portal. They've had to manage that type of stuff, at least at a minimum. And Meyer doesn't have that experience, and some other coaches don't. And it sounded like it was down to Mike Elko or Jonathan Smith, and Elko was being targeted by Texas A&M. Smith wasn't. And I thought that Jonathan Smith was the better coaching hire for Michigan State to make compared to Mike Elko. And now he's here, and he's brought several of his staffers with him. And I have yet to watch his introductory press conference or read in depth all the statements that have been made, but Oregon State is a team that I had in my top 15, top 10 to begin the season. And before potential power got temporarily shut down, and it will be back up next season, I promise. I even bought some programming books so I can attempt to go at it myself. Um, anyway, on a different note, potential power is over 50% in predicting the spread, 75% in predicting game outcomes straight up. And at the beginning of the season, it had Oregon State inside the top 10, and it had them hovering in the top 15, top 10 for much of the season, even when they suffered some very perplexing losses. Because outside of their game against Oregon, they could have won any of those other three games that were losses. And against Oregon, you could argue that Jonathan Smith probably had his foot already out the door. I heard at least in part of his press conference at Michigan State or some of the statements that he made when he arrived in East Lansing that he said that he knew that he was gone a few months prior. And apparently some players have felt betrayed by that from what I've heard as well. But it is what it is to a certain degree. Because unlike Lincoln Riley leaving Oklahoma after 2021... Oregon State, they don't have a future conference. They don't have a 2024 schedule. And with the Pac-12 being dissolved, their TV revenue dries up, and the future of their program could be dried up, even if they have a great head coach. Jonathan Smith wanted to be a Power 5 head coach, and Oregon State, after this season, they're not going to be a Power 5 program. They're not. They're going to be a Group of 5 program. And Michigan State has more talent. They could offer him a better contract. They could offer him a better assistant pool, better recruiting. And he can still use his West Coast ties because circle back to the fact that the Big Ten is expanding to Washington, Oregon, UCLA, USC. So Jonathan Smith can use his Pasadena ties to frankly recruit in Pasadena, in Los Angeles, in Eugene, in Seattle, in all of the West Coast states, California, Oregon, Washington, along with the Big Ten. I love this hire. I really do. Oregon State right now has one of the best offensive lines in the country. They've only allowed 15 sacks, and they average 5.1 yards per carry on the ground. And Jonathan Smith brought his offensive line coach here. The tight ends are good. Jack Velling, Riley Sharp. Jermaine Terry the second, Bryce Caulfield, I'm going all the way down the depth chart. And last season, I forget the name of the tight end that went in the second round for Oregon State, but he was barely used, but he was just a physical beast, a work of art, developed by Jonathan Smith and his staff. Also, don't forget Mike McDonald, the strength and conditioning coach, who I think is a top 10 strength and conditioning coach nationally. He's coming to East Lansing. I mean, these are some serious hires that are being made. And from what I understand, the defensive hires have not even been announced yet. Also, Dan Van Der Wright, Oregon State's chief chief of staff for over 20 years, is coming over to East Lansing. 
So this is a big deal. I mean, Oregon State's entire program is probably going to be gutted as a result of this hire. And I feel empathy for Oregon State fans. I've loved Oregon State's program. I've been rooting for them for, I'd say, this season and last season as well. They're, they're fun to watch. Mike Valeni, Michigan State fan and famous Detroit radio host, he's been paying very close attention to Oregon State over the past two or three seasons because he likes watching Pac-12 After Dark, which is now extinct, sadly. And when Michigan State was down this year and last year, he wasn't entertained by the product of Michigan State, so he switched over to watching Oregon State. And he paid very close attention to them, and they have great trench play, like Valeni would say. They Their offense is phenomenal, despite not having elite quarterback talent or five stars anywhere. They're a, they're a developmental program. And it's not just because of Smith, who helped Washington under Chris Peterson reach the college football playoff and helped make Jacob Browning a great quarterback in 2016. And when Jonathan Smith left, that's when the offense began to fall down the toilet for Washington. But it's also because of his staff. Brian Lindgren, the offensive coordinator and quarterbacks coach, he's coming to Michigan State. Keith Bonafa, I hope that's how you pronounce his name. The running backs coach, who's coached Damian Martinez, elite running back, a running back who I think has some eligibility left, could come to Michigan State. Martinez is 1,185 rushing yards, averaging 6.1 yards per carry in his five rushing touchdowns. Deshaun Fenwick, another great running back, 500 rushing yards and five rushing touchdowns this season. Great position coach. Jim Michalczyk, offensive line coach. This is a Joe Moore Award offensive line, and I think last year's was of similar caliber. And Brian Wozniak, the tight ends coach. They're all joining Smith offensively. So he's bringing parts of his staff to East Lansing as well. Defensively, defensive backs coach Blue Adams will join Smith in East Lansing. It's rumored that Harlan Barnett might be kept on the staff, and Harlan Barnett said that he hoped to stay on the staff in some role, but from what I understand, it has not been announced officially whether he will stay on the staff. I could be wrong, though. I'm looking, I'm actually browsing through articles right now, and it doesn't, it doesn't sound exactly like it's been announced that he's on the staff. But Barnett is open to that, if Jonathan Smith is open to that. And I think that because Jonathan Smith doesn't have Big Ten ties, he doesn't have Midwest ties, Brian Lindgren's been a Pac-12 guy, same with most of Jonathan Smith's staff, I think it is wise to keep Barnett or to hire defensive coaches who have ties to the Big Ten. I think that'd be smart because Barnett is a decent recruiter. He's not a great recruiter. I don't even know if he's a good recruiter, but he also did a good job of leading the locker room and keeping everything together. This season, he found ways to pull off wins against Nebraska in Indiana, and his teams fought hard, and they played hard. They did. His team did this season with Michigan State. So I think that having him on in a, whether it's coaching the defensive backs, whether you make him an associate head coach as someone to you know keep the locker room together and remain as a father figure for the young men, for the players, I don't necessarily know. But I think that that would be of help to the program. I don't think it's a bad idea. I just, I don't exactly know if that's going to happen or not. Again, the staff roles have not all been film filled yet. They haven't. There are still openings and nothing is complete yet because he was just announced as Michigan State's head coach on Saturday, two days ago. But Blue Adams, Oregon State has good safeties. They have good corners. Oregon State's defensive coordinator, Trent Bray, he is not coming to East Lansing, at least as of now, and I don't think he will, period, amen. And part of me thinks that's smart as well, because I don't know if Oregon State's style of defense, which is pressure, chaos, and eye candy, 
more so smaller players, from what I understand, it's about speed. I don't think that'll work in the Big Ten. I think that that would be, that would result, I think, in a 2018-esque Ohio State defense or a 2021 Ohio State-esque defense, which is all about talent, all about speed and athleticism, which can work if you recruit, but I think it's more preferable to have a physical defense to, to pair that with the speed aspect, and I think you might have to have a different defensive coordinator for that, different defensive staff. Blue Adams, though, you want speed and you want athleticism in the defensive backfield, and Oregon State this season... 12 interceptions, 49 passes defended. They have one pick six, 11 forced fumbles, seven fumble recoveries. And the the defense this season, it wasn't as good as last season's defense, but they were top 50 in points allowed per game. They only allowed 21.5 points per game. The offense, they scored double digits. They actually scored 20 points or more in every game except for their matchup against Oregon. Oregon, outside of maybe Utah, had the best defense that the Beavers played all season long. And again, Smith, halfway out the door already because that game was on Friday night and Saturday afternoon, the announcements made. So at that point, the deal was probably already made. They played close with Washington and Oregon State's defense limited Washington to 22 points. They limited Arizona to 27 points. They had one weird loss at Washington State, who was just hot to begin the season. Cameron Ward played a great game, and he is a great quarterback. But overall, the Beavers have had the best or one of the best defenses in the Pac-12 consistently. Under Smith, at least in the past two two seasons about, Tim Tebesar was fired after a loss to Colorado in 2021, but even Oregon State then didn't have the Pac-12s worst defense, but Trent Bray made several improvements. Keep an eye on him maybe going to USC or some other available defensive coordinator positions. Keep an eye on him there. Maybe he'll get the head coaching gig. Who knows? But offensively, the staff's practically filled out. Uh, Defensively, I can't exactly off the top of my head give some defensive coordinator names outside of maybe the obvious in Trent Bray. Maybe there are some lower-level assistants that can be stolen away. I mean, Jim Leonard is an obvious choice from Wisconsin, or maybe you can get Minnesota's Joe Rossi, whose defense struggled mightily this season, but he produced elite defenses in 21, 22, and good a good defense in 2019. Maybe you go to Penn State, Ohio State, or Michigan and try and get one of their lower-level assistance defensively to become your defensive coordinator. That'd be a big move. Don't think that'll happen, but who knows? Maybe you give Phil Parker a call. Remember, Michigan State alum, and Michigan State has more money to pay a coordinator than Iowa does. But that's just off the top of my head. A lot of that's unrealistic outside of probably Jim Leonard or maybe Mike Tressel from Wisconsin, maybe Joe Rossi. He's been at Minnesota for years now. He's proven, I think, just all the production they lost from last season and some pretty back-breaking losses caused the defense to fall off a cliff for Minnesota. I don't necessarily put all of that on Rossi, but who knows? Maybe I'll make a video on that. It's been hard to make videos about coaching carousel during the regular season. I wanted to get to those videos, but this week is when all of that's going to come right in your guys' face. So subscribe and hit the notification bell again if you want to see videos like this about coaching carousel. And for Iowa and Penn State, let me know if you want to make videos about some of my potential offensive coordinator candidates for those soon-to-be-available positions for Iowa and available position for Penn State. Also, if you want to support the channel but gain some bonus content, make sure to check out my Patreon page via the link in the description and the link in the pinned comment. And finally, for strength and conditioning, I mentioned this earlier, Mike McDonald, massive upgrade. Massive upgrade for strength and conditioning. Michigan State has suffered injury after injury after injury after injury the past two seasons. They've looked unprepared. They've been out physical. They've been worked for two years in a row. And in 2021... That was more Kenneth Walker, 
Jaden Reed, Peyton Thorne. That was more skill position players and defensive D'Antonio recruits than physical development. I mean, Michigan State got away with a lot of close games. Sometimes that's a sign of physicality. Other times that's a sign that you have some great players, but an overall incomplete roster. And I think it was more the latter, especially with Kenneth Walker and how elite he was in college. A Mike McDonald, phenomenal strength and conditioning coach. And you can see that in Oregon State's defensive improvement and elite offensive line, tight end and rushing attack and all that, all that play, I guess is the best way to phrase it over the past few seasons. So the staff's being built. I think it's one of the better staffs in the nation right now. That doesn't mean it's elite or necessarily near elite, but better as in it's a great staff. It's a top 25 staff from what I've seen right now. Lindgren's a great offensive coordinator. He's done great work at quarterback with Aiden Childs and DJ Uyunglele, who both have over a 140 passer rating. Uyunglele has three touchdowns to every one interception. Childs has 309 passing yards. Uyunglele on the season is top 15, 12th to be specific in quarterback efficiency, and he also has 219 yards rushing. Childs, that's a name to look out for in the transfer portal. If Aiden Childs follows Jonathan Smith to Michigan State, Caton Hauser, by the way, just literally a few minutes ago, is entering the transfer portal per Pete Thamel. That leaves Sam Leavitt, who may or may not transfer out. Maybe Aiden Childs transfers in. Michigan State could have one of the Big Ten's better quarterback rooms next season, depending on how the dominoes fall. Especially if, let's say, J.J. McCarthy leaves for the NFL draft after maybe he pops off in the Big Ten championship game and dominates in two college football playoff wins, and Michigan goes 15-0 and and wins it all behind J.J. McCarthy. But McCarthy probably returns next season, but nonetheless, Childs is a great player. I think he's the highest ever ranked recruit to play and commit to Oregon State. Now, I think it's highly unlikely that he stays there, given the state of Oregon State's program. So he would be a great get, and Michigan State is going to have to go after players in the transfer portal especially from Oregon State. That's obvious because Smith has built a relationship with a lot of those players, same with the staff, but also from other schools. I expect Michigan State to be competitive next season. I do, and that should be the expectation. With the transfer portal, with that great of a staff, and also this season, Michigan State, look, they were terrible this year. But you saw some moments, whether it was in the wide receiver room, running back with Nathan Carter, tight end with Malik Carr. Malik Carr just doesn't put in effort, but he has talent. The offensive line at times looked competent, and we know defensively, at least in the front, there is talent to be utilized there. And with Sam Leavitt at quarterback, and even Caden Hauser at times, you had moments. Using the transfer portal, having Far superior coaching compared to anything we saw in the Mel Tucker era or in the Mark D'Antonio era post-2015 or post-2014 after Pat Narduzzi left and after the roster began to suffer the consequences of coaching ineptitude. Looking at Michigan State's 2024 schedule, what they have on the roster, and my own opinion of Jonathan Smith and what I think he can do given the greater tools and resources that Michigan State has to offer, I'd expect them to be more competent and competitive in Big Ten play than they were this season. I think a losing record would be unacceptable next season. Let's look at the schedule, though, because Michigan State last year and in 2022 had to play a Washington team that was top 10. In 2024, Michigan State opens up against Florida Atlantic on August 31st. They travel to Maryland September 7th. They host Louisiana, not LSU, Louisiana, the Ragin' Cajuns, September 14th. They play at Boston College September 21st. And they host Ohio State September 28th. Play at Oregon October 5th, and they have a bye October 12th. There is a scenario where Michigan State enters the Ohio State game 4-0, there's also a scenario where they enter that game 2-2, two two, losing to Maryland on the road 
And Boston College went bowling this season, and Castellanos is a good quarterback there, so I could see them dropping that game. The Ohio State game or Oregon game, I, nor anyone I think with sound logic, at least at this point, would chalk those up as wins. It's too early. We don't know who's coming back for most teams. This is very early speculation on my part, but I want to list out the schedule to give some perspective. After the bye week, the Spartans host Iowa October 19th, winnable game. They play at Michigan October 26th. Don't think that's a winnable game right now, but again, like Ohio State and Oregon, let's see. Host Indiana November 2nd, winnable game. Then there's a bye November 9th. Michigan State plays at Illinois November 16th. They host Purdue November 23rd, and they host Rutgers November 30th. Looking at Florida Atlantic, Louisiana, Indiana, who fired their coach, that's, in my mind, three guaranteed wins. Very early, though. Way too early opinion. Rutgers, Purdue, Illinois, Iowa, Boston College, Maryland. That right there... That's six That's six games Michigan State can win, or six games where I think Michigan State, outside of maybe Rutgers, who I think could have a big year next season, that's five games where Michigan State would be favored to heavily favored to win. And then three games at Michigan, at Iowa, Ohio State, that Michigan State would be hefty underdogs and probably wouldn't win. So a bowl game would definitely be in the picture and Michigan's a rivalry game and Ohio State depending on what they lose they could have they could have one of their worst seasons in quite some time people said that this season and I didn't buy it next season depending on who they lose depending on what they do in the portal that might be something I could buy but probably not nonetheless though there is some opportunity next year to be competitive, have fun, bring back the fan base into the fold. And I think especially on offense, the offensive line, the tight end room, you'll see improvement. And I think you'll see improvement at quarterback consequentially because of better protection, but also because whether it's Aiden Childs or Sam Leavitt, there will be better quarterbacks based off of talent alone compared to Hauser or Kim, plus better development and better schematics thanks to Brian Lindgren and Jonathan Smith. Jonathan Smith, speaking of which, I made this point earlier, but he needs to make great hires on defense. Only offense won't work. The Big Ten's a defensive conference. Michigan, they've made tons of improvements and strides offensively over the past two seasons. 2021's offense wasn't good enough, so in 2022 and 2023, are the offenses perfect? No. Are they elite? No, sadly, as I am a Wolverine fan, but they are great to near elite, and that paired with an elite defense is more than good enough to win it all, especially when you don't turn the ball over and you're one of the least penalized teams in the country and you have NFL depth and NFL players. There needs to be a balance. So a great defensive hire paired with great offensive hires, that is an elite staff. And preferably, since the offensive staff is mainly, I think what the offensive staff is, is bringing Smith's ideas and his philosophy to Michigan State. And I think the defensive staff needs to be anchored in the Big Ten's philosophy. Because Smith's an innovator. He is. He's a genius. His offense is a work of art. And I think that's why he brought the whole offensive staff with him, because that will make it easier for him to implement the system he wants to create and construct here in East Lansing. Defensively, I'm hoping that he's wise enough, and I think he is, to realize that he probably needs to take a different approach defensively in the Big Ten compared to the Pac-12. So I think these defensive hires, whether it's Jim Leonard, Joe Rossi, maybe you poach Mike Tressel. He was a great coordinator at Michigan State. Maybe... Maybe you hire Tom Allen as your defensive coordinator. That would be a great hire. It would be. Or maybe he's content sitting with his $20 million buyout, which is top 10 in history despite it being an Indiana buyout. Or maybe you go after one of Ohio State or Penn State or Michigan's assistants. Maybe you get 
Maryland's defensive coordinator, or UCLA or Rutgers defensive coordinator, or maybe somehow Trent Bray does come to Michigan State but implements a new system. There just needs to be, I think, a change to the Big Ten way defensively. And I think that's something that Scotty Hazelton didn't do well. That bend but don't break scheme really only works if if you have the talent necessary to perfectly execute it. Because if a bend but don't break defense is not executed near perfection, well, that's just a defense that lets opponents march down the field and score. Jim Knowles at Ohio State can do that, especially given the fact that Ohio State has talent offensively, they can score points, and therefore, since you can score points, what you want to do is limit the big play and compress the field and wear down, make make offenses make mistakes, make them impatient, make them feel under pressure, but don't give them opportunities for a big play. That's what a bend but don't break defense's purpose is. That doesn't work when you have Jay Johnson as your offensive coordinator. And I think that it would be better to not go that route because I don't even think that's what Jim Knowles specifically wants to do. I think that's in reaction to last year where his defense got torched on big plays. Build a Big Ten defense. Try and emulate what Phil Parker or Jesse Minter or Manny Diaz or... Jim Knowles, nearly forgot his name, or Joe Rossi, or what Jim Leonard did at Wisconsin before Paul Christ was let go, or Tony White, or Mike Tressel. Even if you want to go to a 3-3-5, make sure it's a physical 3-3-5, not a cute, eye-candy, pressure, turnover, Alex Grinch 3-3-5, which is gross, and if that defense is brought to the Big Ten, it will be eaten alive. It will. So there needs to be great hires defensively. Smith should target Oregon State players and other players from all across the country to transfer to the Spartans. He should use the portal like Mel Tucker did. That's one thing that Mel Tucker did that I think is good because Michigan State was in a rebuild during Tucker. You need to get some Band-Aids along with long-term pieces. Like when you get a wound, you don't just drink your medicine and eat right and rest, you have to seal up the wound, but you also just don't, you don't eat and you don't rest, but then you seal up the wound. You have to do both. Mel Tucker was good at putting the Band-Aid on the wound or stitching up the wound. He was not good at getting the necessary nutrition to heal. That's why recruiting fell off. Or he recruited some busts, both in the portal and at quarterback. I remember when people were saying, just on a casual note, that Caton Hauser was so much better than Jaden Denegal and that Michigan State was going to pass Michigan in recruiting. And that never happened. And in retrospect, that was never going to happen. And that was just a popular talking point, one that I think I might have even fallen for, sadly. But it is what it is. We all make mistakes. This team could be good next season. It really could. If recruiting is on the uptick, if the transfer portal is used right, and if Smith is as good as I think he is, along with the staff and great defensive hires are made, this could be a good team starting next season. And we could see them play some of these higher-tier Big Ten teams competitively and beat up on the smaller and medium-tier Big Ten and non-conference teams that they will face. But Smith could also still be a near-elite head coach or a great head coach, and this could be a rebuild where Michigan State goes bowling, but it's a painful season in terms of getting blown out by Michigan again or blown out by Ohio State. We'll just have to see. There needs to be some patience, but in the long run, I believe in Jonathan Smith, and this hire does strike some fear in me as a Michigan fan. I'm not in terror. I'm not shaking, or I don't feel an imminent sense of doom. I have to see that. I have to see progress before I make that statement, before I go that far. But I believe this will be a successful hire, and I think this is a big-time hire. So far, I think this is the best hire of the season in terms of head coaching opportunities. I think it's better than Elko to Texas A&M. I think it's better than Jeff Lebby to Mississippi State. I do. This is a good coaching hire, and I think Jonathan Smith will work out 
in East Lansing at Michigan State. Thank you all so much for watching this video. Please remember to subscribe, hit the notification bell, like this video, and comment your thoughts on this hire down below. Thanks to Crash2488, Anthony McDowell, and Justin Rogg for being Heisman patrons. Thanks to Spencer Bringher, Snow Witty DLC, and SFS Inverted for being All-American patrons. And thanks to Will Loftus, Gabriel Callender, Roaming Gnome, Matthew Sale, Chris Lane, Austin Christmas, and Zubin Za for being All-Conference patrons. Have a great day, guys, and I will see you all around. Bye-bye.